healthier. I think it's very clear in the case of Lebanon, in the case of Argentina, even in the case of Kenya and other countries present here, that the regulatory environments and the policy environments have a significant and a huge impact, especially when you find that um, the larger operators or the incumbents can manipulate and abuse. Um, I would like to just share an example of a, a, some, a success case. Um, AFRISPA has been, for the past six years, lobbying the African Union um, on the issue of internet exchange points and was able to get a project adopted under the African Union's um, ARAPK program. ARAPK means the African Regional Action Plan for the knowledge economy. And under this particular program, um, we're going to see, starting next year, a project initiated which aims at setting up 15 to 20 more internet exchange points in Africa over the next five years, as well as seeing the establishment of four to five regional or internet exchange carriers who are able to provide inter-African or intra-African transit. The key point I want to make here is that this was approved by the Council of Ministers. So the African Union Council of Ministers for communications from every African country was able to recognize and become aware of this issue and adopt it. Um, and then it was subsequently approved by the presidential plenary. I think that from this forum, we need to find a way of getting messages out towards our policy makers, specific actions, recommendations that would encourage them to take a bold step towards embracing internet exchange points as a focal and a crucial part of the growth and development of their countries. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll take the gentleman right at the back, a question from you, and then we'll get responses to those three questions, and then I'll take another set of questions. So the gentleman right at the back, if you could hold your hand up for the... No, no, right at the back. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Mohib, and I'm uh, from the American University of Afghanistan. I uh, really appreciate all of the experience that you guys shared from Lebanon, Argentina, and um, um, obviously the uh, Kenyan exchange point. <coughs> uh, we, we have a lot of similar problems, just as you f uh, faced. I mean, I am from a private institute, not really a government body, but um, I also work for the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan, where we try to make policy reforms and, and, and also um, work with the government to, to bring in what's needed in the country. Um, my question is to Salam. I mean, uh, you said you work for Cisco's, and Cisco was involved heavily in, in, in implementing a, uh, an IXP in, a, in Lebanon. Uh, how did they get that interest? I mean, how do we in, get them interested in doing that in a, in, a, in a country such as Afghanistan? I mean, where we, we really need it. The, currently, it all works through satellites. All of the communication is through satellite. The ISPs buy their bandwidth from, um, say, Singapore, India, or Bangladesh, depending on what's the nearest and what gets them money. Uh, making internet, obviously, very, very expensive. And um, there is no local point. I mean, even to get to a DNS, you would have to go up satellite and back down, making it slow and expensive. How would you get Cisco's interest in something like this? The only thing they do in Afghanistan right now is um, training and not, not investing in infrastructure. Okay, that'll be it. So, um, Bill, would you like to start and then Salam? Sure. Um, on the question of whether uh, sort of open member-driven uh, association IXPs or uh, commercial for-profit IXPs have a faster growth rate, without question, the member-driven ones have a faster growth rate. Uh, even when they allow their business models to start to look like the commercial ones in terms of pricing and services. Uh, I think that the reason for that is largely because all the difficult problems in exchange points are ones of trust. They're ones of getting the ISPs to come together and agree on what needs to happen. And uh, adding one more party to that trust relationship doesn't make it easier. What makes it easier is everybody actually having to come to terms with that trust and getting to know each other and um, feeling like they can get together in one room and make a collective decision. When they're all just customers of some provider, uh, they get what they need, but it doesn't encourage any 
further or additional growth, I don't think, in the same way that a whole bunch of people recognizing that they're no longer just competitors, they're collaborators does? That would be my answer. Oh. Okay, uh, Salam. Uh, so with regard to Afghanistan, Cisco has already supported one effort to get an exchange point going in Afghanistan in 2002 uh, th that I know of. Um, and uh, I'm sure that there have been other efforts that I don't know of. But. So I work uh, under corporate social responsibility for Cisco. And I, we don't, I don't do any. We have a team that does the partnership for Lebanon. We don't do any other thing. We don't do any commercial activities. And I will pass your message. OK? Uh, maybe I could also add on to that. Um, one of the things that um, uh, the Internet Society is also doing is looking at uh, passing the message of the value in terms of uh, we, we are talking about access. And access being an issue, we realize that exchange points are one of the critical uh, uh, aspects that actually allow for uh, uh, lower costs of access. And so we are partnering with uh, organizations like Cisco uh, to help uh, uh, fund and es establish exchange points. So um, you could definitely talk to me after this and we could see how we could help Pakistan establish, um, Af Afghanistan, sorry, establish an exchange point. Um, uh, because we, we do have them as partners in, in exchange point projects. Further questions? Uh, one, sir, I'll make you last because you've already had a go. So, the gentleman there. Uh, so, sorry, the gentleman in the front row. No, here. And then the gentleman behind the camera in the black um, shirt. Uh, and then perhaps you, sir. Sir, I'm, I'm Curtis Linkers and I do work for an exchange point, uh, which is the CEO of NetNode in Sweden. But that wasn't actually what I stood up here. I also have a role in an association called EuroX which is an association for exchange points uh, that covers uh, North America, currently by members of North America, Europe, and Asia. Um, EuroX also uh, has a lot of resources available. I want to come back to the point about uh, that was discussed about the uh, making policy awareness and also, as Bill was saying, about how do you uh, create the trust between the large exchange points, uh, between the large providers. Um, that is actually, in a way, also something that even mature and developed exchange points face the same problem. How do you create this, this trust and, and enable more peering and more free, free, free flow of traffic, which is something that UREX has actually worked with, trying to share, share experiences and, and data between all the members uh, and, and come up with ideas, talk to the providers. We invite them to have two forums, uh, forums twice a year, and we try to get a lot of this, this material out to exchanges, and that might be of interest to, to exchanges that are developing. And UREX is a member-based uh, organization, uh, and we are currently looking into ways to how we can reach out to developing countries, developing exchanges, and what we can do in this area. Uh, if you have input on this, if you want to know more, then, well, please come and feedback to me, or talk to me, or there's also Malcolm here sitting here, who also happened to be involved with EuroX. But I do think that, as, as, as Bill said, there's a lot of this work trust, with trust to be done. Uh, not, and just want to share, that is not only a problem in developing countries. It's, might even be worse, the, the bigger and more money the telco has, the more distrust they carry. But um, there is a lot of work there, so it will be done. Thank you for that. Um, gentleman there behind the camera. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Bani Lara from uh, an internet exchange in the Philippines. And I would like to thank Bill Woodcock for and Packet Clearinghouse for helping us set up our internet exchange point. So my, my question is, um, we have tried to gather uh, the ISPs and the major telcos in the Philippines to connect to our internet exchange. And we have been uh, fairly uh, successful in connecting at least the, the second rank up to the smaller ISPs um, on the premise that maybe if we can get all these um, lesser players, the big one, the monopoly, will connect. So right now, we have got them connected, but still um, the number one telco in the Philippines is quite hesitant in connecting to our internet exchange. And right now, some of the members are playing with the idea of um, fi filing a complaint to the government regulatory commission that handles the ISPs. 
So uh, please take note, they, they are just thinking of the idea, but not really um, have done anything about it. So um, any comments on the wisdom of forcing the, the largest ISP in uh, uh, telco in the Philippines to connect instead of um, them connecting um, at their own pace? Um, thank you, and I'll quickly take your question, Sarah, and then we'll get answers on those three questions. Yeah, my, my question is uh, for Bill Woodcock. Um, don't you think, Bill, that uh, the incident between Sprint and Cogent can jeopardize the future of uh, the unregulated uh, peering model of the internet or, um, and the existence of the free peering uh, uh, zone? Bill? Um, so, uh, first, regarding the Philippine IX, uh, let, me, let me take uh, Malaysia as an example there. Malaysia has now a reasonably successful exchange point, but it took three tries to get an exchange point there. They've been trying since for 10 years, so two prior attempts. Um, each time, there was the feeling among the ISPs that they needed to work to involve the two incumbents there, um, uh, Telecom Malaysia and, um, uh, sorry, blanking on the other one. Uh, and both times what happened is that the, the two large incumbents uh, used everyone else's idea that they were dependent upon them to sidetrack the process, to uh, make the exchange point unviable. Um, by contrast, in other countries where people have not gone out of their way at all to accommodate the incumbent, remember that the incumbent their, their real desire is just that there not be an exchange point, because the exchange point takes revenue away from the incumbent. Uh, it, it takes revenue away from the incumbent and plows it back into the internet economy in such a way that the whole economy grows instead of just one company continuing on its existing growth path. Um, so they would really rather there was no exchange point. Uh, if they sense that they have power in a negotiation. What they will try and do is they will try and make the exchange point uh, as minimal as possible. Uh, and when I say minimal, I don't mean lightweight and efficient. I mean minimal in terms of success. Uh, and so, so really not accommodating them, going on, doing the rational thing, doing the thing that is going to be best for everyone else, allows everyone else to grow as quickly as possible. Over time, the incumbent will have a slower growth rate. They will make less money, and everyone else will make more money. Everyone else will be able to reinvest more. And eventually, and th this is often very difficult to see at the beginning. It seems impossibly far away. But eventually, if your growth rate is more than doubling every year, and their growth rate is less than doubling every year, you'll catch up with them. Um, collectively, all the other ISPs will, will bypass them in terms of, of size and economic clout. And by that point, they will, they will have joined the exchange point, and they will have joined it on everyone else's terms, not on their own terms. So that would be my recommendation, is to not, not compromise your principles uh, for the incumbent, because the incumbent is not interested in meeting you halfway, and they're not interested in the, the, the growth of the economy as a whole, or of the country as a whole, uh, or of the internet as a whole. They're interested in preserving their own position. Um, and obviously, I'm speaking in general terms, not just about the, the Philippine incumbent or the Malaysian incumbent, but speaking of incumbents generally. Um, regarding the, the Sprint Cogent uh, breakdown of peering, Cogent is often involved in breakdowns of peering. Uh, and some people would say that, some people would, would look at that and say, oh, well, this isn't a coincidence. Cogent must be doing something wrong to always be having these failures. 
Other people would look and say, well, the failures themselves, they speak for themselves, a failure is a failure. Um, you know, a better provider wouldn't have these failures by definition. Um, if you look a little bit more deeply, what's happening is that Cogent tends to sell at a much lower price than many of the other large carriers that they peer with. And so often those other large car carriers will use a shutting down or a renegotiation of peering terms as a lever against Cogent if Cogent has entered one of their markets and started undercutting them. Now, this is not to say that Cogent is, is a perfect carrier by any means. Um, you know, they, to some degree, you get what you pay for. And if you're paying less money to Cogent, you're going to have these kinds of outages. Uh, it kind of stands to reason. Um, and that, in turn, brings up the question, well, if it's in the government's interest, government's generally interest, and regulators' interest to make sure that everyone gets good performance at a low price all the time, then why not just say that everyone should have to peer with Cogent so that customers can get cogent level pricing without the outages, which are purely political, right? Um, I have a tiny bit of sympathy for that point of view because I always like things that bring prices down for users. And there's a logic, there's a, a, a consistency to that argument. The problem with it is what if we weren't talking about cogent? What if we were talking about uh, intercage, a, a, a truly evil criminal organization that was connected to the internet, that was hosting malware, that was a, a platform for internet crime. If regulatorily everyone is required to peer with everyone else, that enables crime. And if ISPs are not allowed to de-peer other networks for violating community standards, then we no longer have a mechanism of policing ourselves. So if we invite the government in to require interconnection, to require, for instance, a mandatory multilateral agreement between ISPs, we also have to depend upon them to do all of the housekeeping and all of the law enforcement and so forth that so far we've been able to do more effectively than governments have. Thanks, Bill. Um, I think we have time for perhaps one or two final questions. We've got. Oh, sorry. But just while Machuki, before you answer that, is can I just see a show of hands of anyone who does have any more questions? I think we've exhausted you. So, um, Machuki. Um, mine was to just add on to the uh, comment from the Philippines and uh, regarding how to make the incumbent telco to come to peer at the exchange. Um, the more attractive, uh, I, I said this in, uh, during my presentation, the more attractive the exchange point becomes, uh, you subject the telco to two types of um, uh, pressure. One is to deliver on efficiency in terms of lowering their costs, and two, from their clients. I'll give you an example in Kenya where um, for a long time uh, when the incumbent was not peering, there was a lot of questions as to why their services to specific people, uh, their services were not good. And they will lose clients to people who are connected to the exchange points because they get better service, quality of service through the exchange point uh, to the available content. Um, and one of the things to do, and maybe it's something we can also discuss, I don't know whether you have a root server in Philippines. And uh, Autonomica is there. Okay, iRoot is there. And so uh, these are some of the values which actually uh, contribute to the importance of the exchange point, making it more attractive. And so as you grow your traffic, their cost of delivering traffic to you, to members of the available at the exchange point becomes higher. The more they stay out, the more expensive it becomes for them to deliver traffic to members available at the exchange point. Secondly, their, their clients will start complaining that they do not get better service compared to service providers who are actually participating at the exchange point. And once they start losing business and their operating expenses to deliver per bit goes higher, it sort of forces them to now join. And if you remember in my diagram, I showed that 
at the, at the end result, you get the incumbent telcos actually pairing at the exchange point and still providing transit at the same time. So th th that's basically um, the whole value that the exchange point does bring. I, I hope that helps. Yeah. Uh, does anyone on the panel have a final comment or? Hi. Um, then it falls to me to, on your behalf, thank the, the panelists for what has been a very interesting and lively session, and I'd ask you to show your appreciation in the usual way. And perhaps we'll be back in a year's time. We'll see. <laughs>